Welcome back, everybody. So as we recap the Sean Great case, and welcome, this is right at the beginning. This is the prosecution's opening statement. You're hearing how he's not only charged with the murder of two women, kidnapping, rape, um, and also the rape of a third uh, woman, but then you hear these burglary counts because he's also been charged with breaking into a camper and, and taking some things from there. And this becomes a really complicated case where he's charged with 23 separate crimes, and it becomes a very complicated mess. But I'm happy to get, help have someone to help explain this complicated mess to me. Joining me right now is long crime trial analyst, Jonna Spillboard. Jonna, great to see you. Jesse, always good to see you. Now, we're trying to see how the prosecution here is doing this. I have to say, it's not an easy job for the prosecutor here to lay out the facts about all of this, right? It's a tough job. Well, it's a tough job, but the facts of this case, and excuse my voice today, <clears throat> the facts of this case are so gruesome that you have to lead with that. I mean, it's just terrible. The, the, the woman who actually made the escape and was able to call the police was living among decaying bodies. She had to know she was going to be next. It's an incredible story. And, and later on in the program, we're going to play that for you, her extremely emotional and heart-wrenching uh, heart testimony. Think about it. She was living in that house. She was being brutalized. Well, I should say, allegedly, the, this is the beginning of the trial, and we're going to hear what uh, she ultimately had to testify to. But again, Sean Great faced 23 counts and everything from kidnapping, rape, robbery, burglary. It's a whole mess. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to jump back into those prosecution's opening statements. Stay tuned. You're listening to the prosecutor really delve into the details, the horrible details, about how Elizabeth Griffith's body was found. And she, her body was found, her decomposed body was found in this house of horrors, along with the body of Stacy Hicks and the, the rescued victim, uh, the unidentified woman who actually testified in this courtroom against Sean Great, how she said she was brutal, brutally raped by this man for days. Let's bring back on long crime trial analyst Jonas Spillboard. As the prosecutor goes through these details of what happened, mm -hmm. you get the sense from him, is it a sense of, I can't believe the words I'm saying? Is it how the, the hatred he feels for uh, Mr. Great? What, what do you yeah. detect in his voice? Mm -hmm. You know, what he's doing right now is interesting because there's something, he just said something that I missed the first time around. I don't remember hearing about the stuffed animals, right. which adds just another layer of creep to this whole scenario. And the fact that, so he's not, listen to what he's doing. He's like, there's a bed, crumpled sheets, and restraints all over the bed. So the jury right now is saying to themselves, why? He was using those restraints, obviously, to tie his victims to the bed so they could not get away. Is the prosecutor trying to paint a picture in the minds yes. of the jury? And he's giving them fact after fact after fact to do that. It's kind of brilliant, if you ask me. Well, when you listen to what he's accused <clears throat> of, Sean Great, and you try to connect the three women, again, he's been accused of being a serial killer, mm -hmm. a serial predator. Mm -hmm. What do these three women share? Are they were they were in need of someone? I yeah. mean, Elizabeth Griffin, <clears throat> um, Stacey Hicks, I mean, they all were in need of someone at that point when he came along? So he actually, you know, he had to pick his victims carefully, right? Because he had to pick people who maybe were not so well off, who he could manipulate quite easily, who maybe didn't have a strong support system. I mean, he had to, he had to pick those people. And he picked them, uh, you know, I guess he picked them well because he managed to have three of them under his roof, killing two and then keeping the last one alive until, I mean, thank God she was able to escape and finally call the police and get them over there. This guy reminded me, I remember talking to you about this the first time, he reminds me of like a modern day Jeffrey Dahmer mm -hmm. for the simple fact that he kept the dead decomposing bodies to me as a trophy. Why else do you keep dead decaying bodies? that you, you, you can't really breathe that air. Why do you keep them if not as a trophy? Well, I should say allegedly because this is the beginning of the case and we are going to cover it in its entirety and we'll let you know what the verdict is later on in the day. But you mentioned Jeffrey Dahmer. If you look at Sean Great, you mm -hmm. see him pass on the street, he seems like a nice looking guy. You would never suspect Did Jeffrey him. Jeffrey Dahmer? Right? 
right? Same thing. Like you would never. I, I know you can't say, well, he doesn't look like a serial killer, right? Because we don't know. Like, right. But he looked like just an average guy. I guess that, that he looked like an average guy. So did Jeffrey Dahmer. That's the disarming quality of right. him. Right. So right. people would place their trust. I mean, that's what the prosecution keeps trying to say. And they, they'll, they'll get into more details about how he met these women and what um, he ultimately did. I just mm -hmm. I, the details of it are so bizarre. I, it's so hard to swallow and and disgusting, really disgusting. Yeah. Jury's going to be disgusted. Well, we are going to continue on with the prosecution's opening statement when we return. And we're going to learn a little bit more about what happened to Elizabeth Griffith what happened to Stacey Hicks, and what happened to the victim who survived. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Wow. Wow. Are you listening to what was found in this house where Elizabeth Griffith's body was found? Jonna, mm. I've heard a lot of things before, yes. but this one I mean, I don't even know what to say. A pole wrapped in condoms. Yeah. What's going on? Well, you said it, you summed it up best when you said this was a house of horrors. Every fact that this prosecutor is feeding to the jury right now is another fact in this house of horrors. Just the slow way. And you got to remember, opening statement, you, there's no argument there. You're not arguing your case in opening statement. It is there to give the jury a roadmap mm -hmm. of what they're going to hear. And he is so slowly and methodically giving them gruesome fact after gruesome fact after gruesome fact. No argument. I'm just laying it out for you, ladies and gentlemen. And I got to tell you, it's working because mm -hmm. it's really painting a picture, a picture I never wanted in my head and a picture I don't think <laughs> any of the jurors wanted in their head. But now they're imagining this house where these two bodies were found and this woman was rescued. Let's play a little bit more of the prosecution's opening statement. And you can hear a little bit more, as John has said, the roadmap of where they're going to go. You know where she is, she's in a better place. I'm here with Jonas Spilbor. So if that's the statement that Sean Great made to police, yeah. what are you supposed to make from that? Uh, it's, you know, it's a step toward a full confession. He doesn't say that he's killed her. He doesn't say that she's dead. They're soon going to learn <laughs> that she is. I'm personally offended that he's describing a person that he choked to death as crazy, when clearly he's the one who's crazy. Um, so yeah, so that's, I think, the direction this is going. The details of this are so heinous. She was wrapped up in a way where if she moved, she was going to be choked to death? Yeah. Is that what you heard? Uh, well, yeah, he, there was a ligature from her ankle to her neck. I guess it was essentially like a, a hog tie position, which would prevent her from making any movement. He could have killed her himself with his hands before tying her up that way or after tying her up that way. That's not yet been uh, proven but you know think about how th th no dignity he didn't he killed these women gave them no dignity whatsoever right, that's disgusting. that is really that's the best way to say it Jonna mm -hmm. we're gonna cover more of this case including this admission from Sean great we'll be right back Welcome back, folks. I know that this is extremely hard to listen to, but this is so important in this case. The prosecution, in their opening statement, is explaining what Sean Gray, the defendant himself, told investigators about what he did to Elizabeth Griffith, one of the victims in this case. I'm here again with law and crime trial analyst Jonas Spilbor. Why on <laughs> earth would this man say this to investigators? Well, obviously, he's uh, at that point, he figured the gig was up. However, this is this is why I, I enjoy uh, watching these very high profile cases a second time. <clears throat> because again, I miss the fact that this creep held open one of his victims mouths with a sex toy so that the flies could decompose her faster. That is that is an incredible fact. What that tells you, the mind of this man, and look, he's not, I don't think his defense here is not insanity at all, but the mind is so deranged, it's beyond comprehension. It seemed to work. These two bodies, these two decomposed bodies were found in this house. I, I just don't understand, I mean, you're a defense attorney. How on earth, if you're sitting there representing Sean Gray, you're like, oh, how could he do this? How could he say this to investigators? You know, if I were representing Sean Gray, 
I don't know if I'd be sitting at a trial. I would have done whatever it took. You know, if you can fashion a deal, and this is a death penalty case, if you can fashion a deal to save his life and not put the victims, victims' families and jurors and everybody through this, I would have moved heaven and earth to make that happen. I'm more impressed with the prosecution, who's not as excited as I am, laying out these facts. Good for him. Well, I'll tell you, you said it right. It is a death penalty case, and he will, his defense team will do anything to try to avoid that. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, there's a lot more about Sean Great's admission. Welcome back, everybody. You know, we're still kind of reeling from Sean Great. Uh, this is the case that we're covering, and we're still reeling from when the prosecutor in his opening statement explained that Sean Great admitted to killing Elizabeth Griffith. Uh, I'm again here with John Spillboard. Did do you get the flavor that he first admitted it because she was somehow sexually attracted to him, as if he was explaining why this happened? I, uh, I guess that could be part of it, because, you know, anybody who commits a heinous crime like this has to be a narcissist. And that's going to come out in his admission. But can I just can I harken back on something else that I'm noticing now that we're replaying this? This prosecutor is not, he's describing. I don't see any detailed descriptions. I don't see any pictures being flashed for the jury. And he is just telling a story word by word. And we already are getting the flavor that this was an incredibly disgusting and heinous like you said, House of Hearts. He's doing a fabulous job. And that's why we're covering this case. We're recapping it for you. This is one of the most infamous cases we covered here on Law and Crime about this accused serial killer out of Ohio in the Midwest. And it was a really tough case to listen to from multiple angles. Remember, we're talking about the decomposed bodies of two women found in this house. Another woman who was brutally raped for days was able to escape and call 911. I mean, the details of this case are short of a, a horror movie. And that's what we're covering. And we're playing everything from the beginning of the case to now. And the first part of the prosecution's case was about what happened to Elizabeth Griffith, one of the victims here. And we know that she was a, a, a young woman, a very sweet woman. She was mentally deficient in certain ways. You will hear more about that. And what I want to play for you right now is Tina Schwartz, a social worker, who describes what happened when Elizabeth Griffith went missing. I know this can be difficult to listen to, but it's important. Take a look. Tina Schwartz. So that was Tina Schwartz, a social worker, describing when Elizabeth Griffith went missing. And how eerie is that part? We hear it so many times in these cases, and, and, and I'm here with John Spilbore again. Mm -hmm. How many times do we hear these cases about how a discovery is made that someone is kidnapped or someone's killed? I find that such an eerie part of that. You know, she's saying yeah. here she, uh, uh, she hadn't seen Elizabeth for a couple of weeks. She checked the apartment, the, you know, checking places Elizabeth could go. Right. You see this so many times, and I find that one of the most compelling aspects of any mm -hmm. case when people discover that something's wrong. Well, and not everybody has a social worker. So, I mean, typically what happens is, you know, if you didn't show up for work for a couple days, somebody's going to call and say, hey, Jesse Weber is missing. Right. <clears throat> and, but uh, oftentimes, the police will be saying, Jesse Weber's a grown man. Maybe he just you know, doesn't feel like maybe he's on a plane to Fiji. Like, what do you want us to do about it? So there's really that critical juncture between the police getting notified that somebody's missing and what they're going to do, if anything, about it. And we know that Elizabeth Griffith, um, although she was an adult woman, she was uh, mentally uh, deficient she in certain capacities. She had a capacities. social worker, right. Exactly. So <laughs> her going missing is something out of the norm. I want to play you right now Ed Staley. This is the BCI agent, one of the most critical witnesses in this case. This is the person who unfortunately discovered the decomposed bodies of Stacey Stanley and Elizabeth Griffith. Take a look. That was Ed Staley, the BCI agent who discovered the bodies of these two victims. And I want you to really think about that for a second. This is not a regular crime scene. As he explained himself, seeing black tape over a door is something that's quite unusual. Go into his shoes for a minute and think about going into this house, finding the decomposed bodies of these two women. Unbelievable. I'm here with Jonna Spilbor again. Jonna, if you stepped into his yeah. shoes for a second, thinking about going in there and what you see, sex objects, right. fly larva, <clears throat> restraints, <clears throat> yep. this is horrific. Well, I think the first thing that would have smacked him in the face would be the smell of human decomposition. And I'm going to tell you, Jesse, like, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I've seen tons of autopsy photos. You get a little desensitized to those. 
What's not on my bucket list is smelling a decomposed human body, and I've n never done that. But I can imagine that it is unmistakable. And I think, you know, once he walked into that house, I'm surprised that outside the house, it, even though he tried to cover it up by putting this victim in a, in a closet, stuffed animals, tape, the, the yeah. extra flag, you know, I, I think that you could, I, it's unmistakable, and I think it's going to permeate well beyond the boundaries of that house. One of the important things that we do here is we show you the reality of what these crimes are actually look like. This isn't uh, Perry Macy or Perry Mason or <laughs> Matlock where somebody gets shot, there's no blood, and they're... Uh, right. and fly larva. These are things you don't think about until you hear these kinds of cases. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and the fly larva was a, a telltale sign that there was some sort of formerly living flesh in that closet, in that house, because that's what the flies do. Now, despite the fact that Mr. Great was found at this house and that uh, the surviving victim testified against him, that is not an open and shut case. We are going to reveal the verdict later on about what the jury ultimately decided and whether or not the prosecution presented enough evidence to convict him. There's a lot at stake here. There's a lot we're talking about. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Now, I could be wrong, but did you hear a little bit of emotion from Ed Staley? A little bit he had to take a minute when he was talking about the decomp uh, decomposition of these bodies that were found. Jonna, did you see that? I did not detect that, but only because my mind is just drawing a picture. Every time he described the white larva, we see the pile of clothes. I just had this picture in my mind of what horrific scene he was the, uncovering. That was a picture in your mind. Yes. What is the picture in the jury's mind? How much are they supposed to hear of this? How much does it cross the line of, we understand there were decomposed bodies, and how much do we have to understand the fly larva, the, the, the maggots, the level of decomposition? Is that evidence, or is that too much? No, I do not think it's too much in this case. I think the jury needs to have every single piece of this to get a clear picture of what kind of monster this defendant is. And most especially because this is a death penalty case. This is a very unusual case. But for the grace of God, we have a third victim who lived to talk about it and, and get to the police. In other words, are you saying that because it's a death penalty case, the jury should hear more of these details yes. because they're ultimately going to have to make that decision? Jesse, yes. And those kind of gruesome details could be very important in whether a jury decides to spare this person's life or give him the death penalty. They've got to know every single fact. It's not too prejudicial. Okay. Well, we want to play you a little bit more of uh, Ed Staley. I want to just confirm, is that that's who we have up next, right? Great. I want to play a little bit more of his testimony because he really was one of the key witnesses for the prosecution. And when I think back about this case, it's his testimony that I really think about. This is the man who discovered what really no one should have to discover. Take a look. Welcome back, everybody. We are recapping the Sean Great murder case, and I got to tell you, I've already watched this trial, but every time I listen to Ed Staley, and remember, he's the person who found the decomposed bodies, it gets to me. I, 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 it just gets to me. And a little bit later on, we're going to play you the testimony of Kim Majors, another lead investigator in this case. Well, Jana, as I listen to this, I have to wonder, what is the defense thinking as they're <laughs> sitting here and listening to the decomposed bodies that were find, found in the same house where their client was. Yeah, so the defense, there isn't a whole lot they can do to sort of tamper this down. These are just gruesome facts. And the facts are the facts. You can't, you can't mess with them. They are what they are. So I don't know what kind of cross-examination we're up against here because like, it, this is just a methodical recitation of what was found. And when you're listening to it, you know that this murder was not an accident, right. that there is aggravating circumstances surrounding how this woman died, uh, which is very important in a death penalty case. I know. And, and the thing about it is, is that you listen to it and you try to separate. How can I mm -hmm. be an impartial juror, sit on this jury? Hmm. Okay. The defendant was found in the same house as the decomposed bodies mm -hmm. and the same house where this woman stole a cell phone and was able to call 911, free herself and say that he kept brutally raping me for days. Not an easy job being a juror, let alone on this case. Mm -hmm. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we have a lot to discuss. 
So that was Detective Kim Majors interviewing the defendant. You heard this audio recording of from the interview. And just to let you know, in case you didn't hear it, basically, Sean Great in that interview admitted to going to Elizabeth Griffith's apartment, playing Yahtzee with her, writing his name on the Yahtzee paper, and then after killing her, going back to the apartment and throwing away that paper. That's disposing of evidence. And also, he said he took a lot of shampoo. She had a lot of shampoo. He took one of the, the shampoo bottles and a conditioner. Jana? As we're, as, it's funny that we're watching this and looking at his defense attorney and him as the audio is being uh, played back. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing I don't get. <clears throat> you kill somebody. You let them decompose in a closet. You um, open their mouth so flies can get in and decompose them even faster. And the thing that you're worried about throwing away is her name on a piece of paper. Uh, isn't that kind of strange? I mean, yeah. he's not only admitting to killing her, but then disposing of the evidence. If you're, I'm watching his defense attorney, and I believe in his mind, is in his mind is just like, oh. there isn't much you can do with this. There's not much you can do on a on a cross examination with that kind of. You just you gotta lay low. But the jury's yeah. listening to this and yeah. they're forming their opinions about what to make of this whole case. You and remember, can't make it better. As you said, this is a death penalty case. There's a lot at stake here for Mr. Great. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we have to play you some more of the testimony of Kim Majors because it gets good. It gets even more good when you hear about what Great admitted to. So we'll take a quick break. We'll be back in a minute. Stay tuned. That's Detective Kim Majors explaining how Sean Great, the defendant, admitted to her to throwing away evidence. Can't believe it. Here with Jonas Spillboard, long crime trial analyst. I'll ask you this question a million times as we keep uh -huh. hearing it. We heard it from the prosecution's opening statement. Now we're hearing it from witnesses. Why, oh, why would the defendant admit to doing this? Why would he admit? You know, you always say, uh, uh, lawyer up immediately, but yeah. why would he admit to doing this? Jesse, that's the least of his worries, honestly. Like, I, you know. Was it leniency? He I, thought maybe he'd get leniency if he was cooperative? I think, like, if, if we were to put ourselves in the head of a narcissistic serial killer, I think at the point when he knew the gig was up, he wants to sort of tell a story. He wants to tell every little detail that, it, that he made in the commission of this crime because why the heck not? I mean, it's not like he was going to help himself. Uh, later on in the trial, we're going to see where he tries to help himself um, by admitting to even more of these crimes. But for, when he's being interviewed by, you know, there could be an element of, like, this is my time to shine. When, and I don't You're saying pride. Decision. This could be a sense of yeah, pride. Yeah, when he's getting interviewed by these police officers, when they finally make these discoveries, he's got, in his mind, he probably had nothing to lose by admitting everything he did. In your experience covering serial killers or people who commit really heinous crimes, mm -hmm. is there a sense of pride to it? Ownership? I th Identity? I, I think... You have to be a special kind of person who's going to kill anybody outside of this, the realm of self-defense. And in these cases where you have multiple people, and, and multiple people that you keep around you as they decompose, there is a special sort of uh, narcissism that goes along with that. And, you know, it's hard for us to, to say, why would you do such a thing? Because we're not killers. But this guy um, was a very special breed very manipulative. He picked and chose his victims very carefully. He, he abused them and used them incredibly before he decided to kill them. And then he kept them around. But here's the flip side of it, too, right? So the prosecution is putting forth their evidence. The prosecution's opening statement is mm -hmm. not evidence. But we're listening to witnesses corroborating what the prosecutor said in their opening statement. We're hearing these witnesses saying, this is what Sean Great told me, that he admitted it. Despite all that, isn't it possible that the defense could say, uh, my client is not telling the truth. He's bragging. Uh, my client was manipulated. We, in other words, just because we have strong evidence here doesn't necessarily mean a guilty verdict. And we're going to release the verdict later on in the program. But just because something seems so strong right now doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Well, here, yes. Could the defense attorney stand up and say, this was all a big fat lie? Yes. But you have the jury, the jury who's going to be looking at pictures of decomposing women 
in this man's house. But the only physical evidence is him at the house, or there's other DNA evidence linking him to the crime as well. But if I'm arguing this case, I'm going to say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you don't die from natural causes hogtied with ligatures around your neck, your ankles, and sex toys holding your mouth open so the flies can get in there and decompose you faster, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Are you surprised that this is one man who's on trial and able to, uh, if you believe the prosecution's case, abduct three women, commit these murders? I mean, it seemed that this you would need a team to do this, uh, in, a, in a sense. This is one man who calculated this, kidnapped three women, and, and I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It seems like, like a lot. how could he do it alone? Well, how could he do it alone? I, I think when you take everything into consideration, the fact that he, the victims were, the way, the manner that he did it, the, you know, he did basically one at a time here. Uh, it is feasible. I mean, we have cases now coming out in 2018 where people have been abducted and we haven't heard from them for years. And then they finally come free. And you can't forget the fact that if she, this woman, this uh, woman who was uh, raped or allegedly raped by um, Sean Grade and she was the one who made the 911 phone call, if that didn't happen, would he still be out there? Would he not Jesse. be on trial? How would these bodies have ever been discovered? Right. If that didn't happen, he wouldn't just have three victims that we know of and five he confessed to. It, you know, that could have doubled. He could still be doing what he's doing. I mean, so, you know, thankfully, she stopped it. The one remaining uh, living victim was able to stop it. We're going to play you her testimony a little bit later on, but I, I have to say, I'm sitting here, if I was sitting here as a juror, this is a death penalty case. Mm -hmm. As they listen to the details of this case, again, you bifurcate it, so there's right. the first the guilt or innocence phase and then the death penalty phase, but how much are they thinking about the death penalty as they even determine their yeah. guilt or innocence? So it's going to dovetail, and I think that's the clever part for the prosecution, because you have to get in these gruesome details. Not only does is it, is it going to give the jur jury information to find the gui gui guilty in the guilt phase? But of course that's going to roll over into the penalty phase. This was no accidental death where you might have some right. forgiveness. This is a gruesome, premeditated murder. You said it right, Jonna. And that's not the only thing that this man was on trial for. We talk about the rapes, the murders, uh, the kidnappings. But he was also charged with robbery and um, breaking into a trailer. And that's what we're going to talk about when we come back from this short break. Maybe the less of his crimes, but still a crime. Welcome back, everybody. We are recapping the Sean Great case out of Ohio unbelievable case where a man who's been accused of being a serial killer on trial for the murder of two women, the rape and abduction of a third woman. I mean, the details of this case are truly, truly horrific. And we are going to jump right back into it in a minute. But before we do, have to sign off my very special guest, Jonna Spielberg. We Thanks do. for coming on this morning, Jonna. You know, thank you for having me. I want to apologize to you, the crew, and our viewers. Obviously, I'm a little under the weather this morning, but I wanted to be here to welcome you back, Jesse, and I wasn't going to miss this day for anything. Well, thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. And the great part about you is you can have a 40% of a voice, and you still deliver an amazing message. Awesome. So that's great. <laughs> One of our best guests over here. Jonna, thank you so thank much. You. We're going to jump back into the courtroom, but now you heard a little bit about Elizabeth Griffith this morning, what happened to her. But as I said, that's not the only thing that Mr. Great was charged with. He was also charged with breaking into a trailer, a camper, and stealing some stuff. I know a lesser kind of crime here, but a crime nonetheless, and it feeds into the larger narrative about what this guy was up to in Ohio. Let's play you some of the prosecution's opening statement about that part of the case. <laughs> 